Right. And now it's going into overdrive, trying to provide supplies, trying to use its convening power to manage global responses. I think there's a sense of guilt there, but I also think it wants to take advantage of this situation to pursue its strategic goal of, of expanding, spreading its influence and clout uh, around the world. Indeed. Now, Michael, you're joining us from Washington, D.C., and not far from where you are, a gentleman called Donald Trump in the White House says both the U.S. and Australia are in favor of an independent investigation into the origin and spread of the virus. Uh, uh, what's the state of play so far as uh, the investigation goes? I mean, is it being seriously considered? And is there a critical mass of countries, you think, uh, which are joining issue with uh, uh, with the U.S. and Australia to call for a probe into into the the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus or the coronavirus or COVID-19, whatever by whatever name you call it. Well, I think clearly there is a growing consensus in favor of taking a harder line uh, on China. And, you know, I think it's not just because of how we've seen China respond initially to the virus, but also the way in which China has considered to aggressively pursue its interests uh, in the course of this pandemic. As you know, there have been a number of reports of, of China using aggressive activities uh, in the South China Sea in terms of how it's dealt with Vietnam and some other countries. And a number of, of nations are concerned about that. Why should China be acting that way? Why should it be trying to exploit a deadly pandemic, pandemic to do things like that, thinking that yeah. people would not notice. So yes, I think there's reason to think that there could be a groundswell of global support for an investigation of China, but I think there, that now is not the time for that. I think now so many countries around the world, and certainly the United States, have to focus above all else on getting the pandemic under control within their borders. I mean, that clearly, you know, we are really suffering here in the United States, as you know. So there, there will be a time, there should be a time for that investigation, but not now. Give it at least a few weeks or a few months. Right. And talking about other countries in the region and beyond, Michael, let's start with India first. Uh, what did you make of India's response to the coronavirus pandemic in terms of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, initiative or decision to enforce a countrywide, a nationwide lockdown for a country of the size and scale as India with 1.3 billion plus people, uh, also imposing a flight ban early on, and then going on to diplomacy where India shared medical supplies such as hydroxychloroquine and paracetamol with other countries. So uh, in your estimation, how would you describe India's response uh, domestically and internationally to the coronavirus pandemic? I would describe India's response both domestically and globally as uh, robust and bold. Uh, so, you know, as, as you know, the number of confirmed cases and deaths in India have been high, but nowhere near as high as they've been in so many other countries, including the US, China, and many countries in the West uh, and in East Asia. And I think that the lockdown that the prime minister announced, uh, I think we have to look that. We, we, we don't really know why at, at this point the, the cases are where they are. But certainly the fact that Modi very quickly and, and mm -hmm. abruptly declared that nationwide lockdown for initially three weeks, I think you have to look, that as a, look at that as a potential factor. If you look at some of the other countries in the world, just Germany, for example, or New Zealand, where you haven't had the scope of the, of, of the, the deaths uh, as, as you've had in other places, you have that consistency of immediate uh, aggressive actions, lockdowns. And so I think that Modi's decision, of course, was, was criticized heavily initially, including by people like myself, for worrying that it happened too, too soon without, any, without enough pre-planning, concerns about what it would mean economically. Now, certainly it will have economic consequences, but the public health factors, I think, are more important. The verdict is still out as to how effective it was, but I think that we need to credit the prime minister for that uh, that bold and, and robust decision. In terms of the global response, well, as you know, we live in a world where multilateralism is certainly not dead, right. but it certainly is is very much absent. And for the prime Absolutely. minister to spearhead an effort um, through the SARC countries to in which he coordinated uh, some type of, co of regional response, I think that's to be praised, and also his efforts to um, try to push the G20 to host a meeting, uh, a virtual meeting on responses to the pandemic. As I understand it, he was one of the leaders that took the major leads in doing that. That's, mm -hmm. that's significant because again, there haven't been any other efforts. The US certainly is not taking any uh, initiative to uh, wage a, gl a global response, unlike what you had with President Obama during the Ebola right. uh, uh, pandemic some years ago. 
And just to amplify your point about Prime Minister Modi, Michael, he has spoken about in the first phase of saving lives and then moved on to saving, talking about life and livelihood. So that's how he has approached this issue. But moving from India's domestic politics to American domestic politics, Michael, uh, in your estimation, what kind of an impact might this have on Trump's re-election campaign? The, the virus pandemic, I, I mean. Right. Well, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting point. Uh, I mean, there have been some polls that have come out, some surveys that have come out over the last few weeks that show that Trump's uh, approval ratings have actually increased, uh, which is, is very striking. Yeah, which is very striking. Um, you know, certainly I think it really depends on the economic cost. Um, you know, I think that uh, we, we know already that the U.S. is suffering economically. Um, and, you know, there was that shocking stat uh, some days ago that you had, uh, what, 22 million Americans file for unemployment within That's just right. several weeks' time, which is unbelievable. Um, I think one of the reasons why President Trump has pushed to open the country up for business sooner than many people, including his own medical experts, believe is appropriate, is that he knows that his rank and file is worried and is suffering. Uh, and so I think that he fears that uh, he needs to show that uh, he's, he's taking their considerations into, into mind. I think that, that Biden, that Joe Biden, his, his opponent, has been strengthened um, by the, the pandemic. It's given him a better chance in a one-on-one -on -one match mm -hmm. with, uh, with Trump. Um, I would argue that, uh, that Biden is a much weaker candidate than he would have been in 2016. He doesn't seem quite as, as strong and robust. But I will say that it will be a closer race between Trump and Biden than I would have thought some months ago. Um, I really don't know who's going to win, but I think Trump is more vulnerable now than he's been at any time before, especially because, you know, the pandemic has really been the first true crisis he's had to face yeah. as president. Uh, and many people, including many of his supporters, think that he acted too late, that his tone and his messaging has been very inappropriate, and mm -hmm. that he simply is not doing a good job. Indeed. Now, Michael, I want you to take a step back and reflect on the so-called post-corona new world order. So if I were to ask you, Michael, what might this you know, post-corona new world order look like and what might be, well, Asia's or India's role in it? Well, it's a good question. And there have been so many commentaries indicating that, oh, the world is going to change. It'll never be the same and, and, and things like that. I'm not sure if I would go that far. I think that much of the world order will remain the same, quite frankly. I mean, the, okay. in terms of ge geopolitical manifestations, the U.S.-China rivalry will be, still be there. Those will still be the two major powers, even though both countries will have suffered considerable economic uh, damage, not to mention public health damage. Um, I think in the immediate term, uh, globalization will will take a hit just because so many countries are going to be focused on inward uh, policies to try to get their economies to recover. Um, certainly, if current trends and patterns hold and the developing world uh, does not experience the, 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 the damage, the public health damage that uh, some lineage of the developed world has experienced, mm -hmm. that could provide opportunities for country like for countries like India to try to take on more of a leadership role in spearheading more multilateralism, uh, maybe mm -hmm. through some, some regional groupings or some, some global groupings that have been more abundant, like the BRICS arrangement, for example. So I think there could be some opportunities for India there. But again, I think that the major realities will stay the same. I mean, US-China rivalry will remain the same. India-China mm -hmm. rivalry will remain the same in, in your region where you are there. Um, and I think that globalization will continue to, to struggle, but it'll, it'll, it'll recover. I mean, uh, you know, countries know that in order to get their economic growth going beyond the immediate term, there needs to be trade, there needs to be more trade. But I think that things will relatively not necessarily return to normal, but I don't think we're gonna have a revolutionary change that so many have suggested could happen as, as we had, say, after the end of the Cold War. The world will change for sure, politically, economically, social interactions, that type of thing. But in terms of world order, I don't think we should overstate the, the major change that we could see ahead of us. And would you describe uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as a 9-11-like you know, -like moment, a potentially 9-11-like moment in the sense that the understanding or concept or definition of security as you and I understood it so far might be undergoing a change and that health security might be front and center of the narrative going forward? 
Yes, no, I definitely think you're right. I mean, the notion of human security, non-traditional security threat, which which many analysts, including myself, have, have highlighted for so long, you know, water shortages, health challenges, these are very real and very, very deadly challenges right now. But indeed, you're right. I imagine that that will become, uh, that'll come to the fore, that interpretation of security. But I would go beyond 9-11. Sure. Um, you know, I do think that at least conceptually, I think that this moment, the, the, pan, the pandemic, what it means for the world, is indeed comparable to the post-Cold War period, just because, you know, the, the yeah. politics will change significantly. Uh, you know, the economies have been, will be so shattered in so many different places. And mm -hmm. also, I think that the most critical thing is that the idea of social interactions will change. I think that the way in which people interact physically uh, will change. Distancing may be um, uh, something that's recommended for a long time indefinitely. The way in which airlines operate, people not sitting next to each other, all of that could change. And so I think that goes mm -hmm. beyond 9-11, which I think, you know, in terms of how things change, was restricted to, to security concepts. But now we're talking about much broader paradigm shifts in terms of how we think about not only the world and how it operates, but how societies should operate. And I want to wrap up by just asking, going back to the China question now, I'm going to help our viewers understand. People, many people are wondering aloud why is China so dead against a probe? What is China's reservations on an investigation, number one? And number two, why is China so worried about it being called the Wuhan virus? Uh, what has China got to hide from the world, if it has? Well, I mean, you know, China is, is an authoritarian state, but it still worries about what people think. It worries about its image. It really uh, values its soft power. And I think that the idea of accountability uh, is not something that's uh, that's very familiar or desirable to the uh, to the regime there. I mean, it, again, it is an authoritarian state, so I think it's unhappy about that. It doesn't want to be embarrassed or humiliated. And same mm -hmm. goes for this notion of whether we should be calling the the virus the Wuhan virus. Yes, I mean, clear, it, it does seem like it originated there. So you know, why not call it the Wuhan virus? Um, but again, I think China doesn't want too much attention brought to a pandemic to a to a virus that has become a huge pandemic in mm -hmm. part because of China's own uh, lack of action in the early days of the pandemic. But I think that's the answer to your question, that it, it simply doesn't want this, this negative publicity, this negative attention. It wants to be seen as a responsible major power and even a superpower. And in that regard, an investigation of the way in which it's handled the pandemic certainly does not serve its interests. Right. On that note, Michael, thank you so much for joining us on DD India. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap on this special broadcast.